Hi, my name is Ben Dobson. I manage Stonehouse Farm and I direct Hudson Carbon. Both entities are located here on the farm in Livingston, New York. We're about two hours north of New York City. Uh, this project started in 2013. At that time, Stonehouse Farm was still a conventional farm, growing predominantly GMO corn and GMO soybeans. And the goal at that time was to show a viable model of farming, and small dairy was not that. So this farm became a grain farm and, and really brought grain farming to our region. The farm was also preserved at that time with the American Farmland Trust. And I was brought in when there was a generational shift uh, in management and ownership of the farm. And the generation that hired me founded the PMR Foundation, the Peggy McGrath Rockefeller Foundation, named after their mother. And the goal at that time was very broad, but it was that everyone agreed it needed to become organic. Um, and we spent a year listening to farms and food, people in food business in our community and region and land conservationists as well to best understand how a farm owned by a wealthy family could make a change without unduly affecting small farms. There's a burgeoning small farm scene here while providing potentially a model or a beacon for larger com conventional commodity farms. And after a year of listening and visiting folks and planning, what we came up with is we should still be a grain farm. There's a great need for local organic and non-GMO grains. And there was a tremendous need uh, for there to be an example of a large farm and landscape quitting chemicals and going organic. So in the fall of 2013, uh, following the harvest of the corn and soybeans, we went fully organic on all the acreage. We planted cover crops, we planted winter grains, and we planted a lot of land into perennial crops, hays and pasture land to build the soil and transition in that manner. We were able to use a lot of techniques such as rolling and crimping for organic no-till systems. Um, during the transition, we built a robust market for local non-GMO grains grown using organic techniques. And we now sell to over 100 small, medium farms and food businesses within 100 miles of our farm. We sell wheat to bakeries who mill their own flour. We sell barley to breweries and distilleries. We sell cover crop seeds to vegetable farms. And then we sell forages, hay and straw, to local vegetable and animal farms. So that's a, a, we've become a part of a local supply chain. And during this transition, we really focused on, on three major premises. One was the idea that the land and the Earth's surface is a, a giant solar collector, meaning that plants are photosynthesizing, and that if the the moisture and warmth and sunlight are there for photosynthesis to happen. We want it to happen on as many square feet of the farm as possible. So we immediately employed maximum cover cropping, lots of perennials, and strategies to underseed, meaning if we're growing a small grain, to spread perennial seeds under it so that when the small grain dies and goes golden, ready for harvest, the next crop's already growing underneath without requiring tillage. So constant green cover. Then minimal tillage. Um, in our organic system, we do till because we don't use glyphosate or chemicals to kill off greenery. And we see benefits to our system over that. Um, but we don't want to till much. And if we do till, it's very important to get that ground replanted and photosynthesizing again very quickly. And then the third part was the incorporation of livestock in a way that emulated and mimicked nature as opposed to uh, the model where we use inputs um, and crop that we harvest and trucks to truck to animals that are closed in a barn. We'd rather have the animals spread their own manure on the landscape as nature intended um, and collect their own food off the landscape as much as possible. So those were the three core principles. And from there, there are tons of variations. Um, um, and all the while, our goal has been to be a financially viable farm. And that's a goal we've accomplished. A, save for we, two things. We do pay outsized salaries and we, all of our employees have health insurance and all of our employees get two or three times the going rate of farm workers, which get abysmal, who get abysmal wages. Our employees get very good wages. So we've had a couple of good years where we still end in the black and a couple of years where if I, if I looked at our wages in terms of a normal farm, we would have been in the black, but we weren't. So our, our real focus is to treat people well while we regenerate the landscape and create a supply chain that feeds the local food system. Um, 
that this cha- has been very challenging. Across the farm, we have multiple soil types ranging from sandy or lighter loams to heavy, heavy clays. So in a dry year, we love our clay, and in a wet year, we love our sand. And we manage and mitigate uh, between those soil types, and we manage our rotation now. It's that we manage a seven-year rotation across the farm where we grow four years of annual grains, and one, the fourth year is a crossover year where we grow a small grain under to a perennial. And so we started at seven years, but we have an overlap year of perennial and small grain. So you could argue that it's four years perennial and four years small grain fit into seven years. Um, and that, we've, that re- this is the first closing of a full rotation for us. It's 2020 now, um, and we started this seven years ago. Well, some fields have followed that full rotation, and now the whole farm has fallen into the seven-year rotation. Um, and I think that uh, two of our major goal was to how do we show a replicable model for a farm this size to become part of a local and regional food system in a productive way that doesn't compete with smaller farms and operations, but also how does a, and how does a farm this size show you know, economic viability? But most importantly, um, I sh- well, for me, it's most important, how does a farm this size become part of the solution to climate change as opposed to part of the problem? Um, previously, we were part of the problem. We, although the topsoil and conventional no-till may have gained a little of the carbon back lost during the prior 20 years of tillage, this farm tilled heavily for 25 years and then no-tilled for 10. Um, it's the, the inputs, what we grew from the farm, the soybeans and corn, went into supply chains that were, were pollution-intensive. The corn, by the end, was mostly going for ethanol, and the soybeans mostly to feedlots in Asia. So basically, our food from this farm was being converted into carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide with a byproduct of meat in other places. Um, so to, to really monitor our impact, at the beginning we hypothesized, okay, organic farming, what does that really mean? The word organic refers to, originally, in the eyes of Sir Albert Howard or J.I. Rodale, um, it means organic matter. Before we had the USDA organic certification, which is now sort of a watered-down set of rules of what you can or can't use, organic referred to, well, we're farming by building our organic matter. And organic matter is 57% carbon. So really, we're, or, original organic farming was carbon farming. The more carbon you build in your soil, the more water you hold, the more nutrients you transfer, um, the more biological health you have, and that's how you grow your crops. And that was the, the sort of visceral reaction many of the early organic pioneers had to the, what they, the pretty quick impacts they saw of synthetic fertilizers and herbicides. So we decided that if we're going to be an organic farm, then we need to watch what happens with our carbon. And in 2015, early early 2015, Abby Rockefeller and I founded Hudson Carbon at this site here. This is a a farmette of Stonehouse Farm. This is called Mud Creek. Uh, Stonehouse manages all this land, but the real estate right here is owned by Old Mud Creek Farm, owned by Abby. Across the way is the scenic Hudson Soil Lab. And we refurbished the soil lab to become a soil lab to study organic matter in the soil and the carbon cycle across this farm. Our farming practices are really based on cycles. So when we're thinking of how we manage the farm, we want to make sure we're managing the carbon cycle in a way where more carbon comes from the air uh, than goes to it. So we want to bring more carbon through our plants and keep it in the plants and soil than goes back out. We want more methane to break down on this land surface than leaves it. And we, want nitri- we don't want to release nitrous oxide or nitrites or nitrates into the water. We, want that. we get little bits out, but we really want our nitrogen to cycle. As Abby puts it, we take our carbon from the earth and we put it in the air. We take our nitrogen from the air and we put it in the water. And reversing these two trends is essential to the future of all life on earth. Um, so with those being the premises, we thought we would we set up 15 sites across the farm where we do intensive carbon research on a everywhere from a weekly to annual basis and on four of these sites on a daily basis. We travel with gas flux, um, uh, gas flux equipment in chambers where we watch our carbon dioxide and methane flux and at times nitrous oxide flux. Um, once a month we go to these sites and we collect biomass samples and we dry that biomass and calculate how much carbon is temporarily stored in the biomass. And every year we take three one meter deep 
soil cores at these sites and we measure the carbon. Um, and then we have three sites with eddy covariance towers that read the carbon flux and methane flux in and out of those locations every 30 minutes, every single day. And they have weather stations as well. And they monitor localized CO2 and they can see if carbon, more carbon is coming into that surrounding landscape or leaving it. So what we've done with these five years of data is built a regression model of our entire farm and modeled how much carbon we have brought into the farm. That's been very important because we can correlate that with what practices took place on those fields at the given time. And we're now starting to zero in on which parts of our rotation build the most carbon and which parts of rotation lose the most carbon. And our project is now expanding further. We, have, we now have st uh, stations deployed at five sites in our waterways to watch um, our nitrogen flows in the water, dissolve carbon, oxygen, and turbidity in water across the farm. And we are now embarking on a composting program and starting to build a research protocol to monitor our aerobic composting system. And we plan to compare that to slurry-based anaerobic manure management systems. So we, feel, we felt that it's very important, not only that we study the carbon cycle of the farm, uh, but now that we really start to watch the methane and nitrogen cycles on the farm vis-a-vis -vis animals. And a huge part of our farm I mentioned earlier is that we do grass-fed grazing of beef cattle, and we've just completed construction of a grass-fed dairy on the farm. And that dairy manure will all be managed aerobically where we'll be making aerobic compost piles, mixing that with other inputs from around the farm, and we'll be watching that manure from the cows to the finished compost. So by closing the barn down and using our methane sensors, we can figure out the, the gross production of methane of that cow herd. And we'll be experimenting with feed stocks to the cows, such as kelp, to understand how much that cuts down their methane emissions. And then in the manure gutters in the barn themselves, we'll be using our gas flux equipment to watch flux of you know, how much CO2, methane, nitrous oxide is coming off the manure and urine in the gutter. And then we'll be working with biochar as a treatment in the gutter to the manure to see how much that reduces methane, CO2, and nitrous oxide emissions from the manure. And then we'll be following that manure to the aerobic composting system where we will watch the emissions of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide from the compost itself. And then we'll watch how much of that carbon stabilizes in the compost. And then we'll be able to watch what happens to the land after we apply the compost. So this, this study will take an overall probably five years to get to conclusions. A lot of the initial things I explained we'll be able to learn in a matter of months, but watching and the, the system of the compost will take six months to a year. But watching the impact of aerobic composts on land and how that stimulates perennial plants versus this fresh cow manure, which we'll use as a, as a comparison, will be very interesting as well. Um, so this is a long-winded way of saying Hudson Carbon is, is there as, as the carbon has become sort of this hot, flashy word, so has regenerative agriculture, and we really need to think about what that means. You know, carbon, people... You know, people don't really know what carbon is other than we've sort of been made to sound like a bad thing. Um, you know, in climate change, people talk about carbon dioxide. And the truth about it is that carbon dioxide is the most important nutrient to plants that's out there. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide. Uh, they separate the oxygen from the carbon. They pump the carbon down through their, you know, their structures. Anything they don't keep to build their leaves, stalks, or roots they exude into the soil as carbohydrates that feed microbiology, which are the, really the basis of all life. So carbon dioxide is not a bad thing. We just have too much of it up above us and not enough of it. And we need to convert a lot more of that back into carbon and keep it where it belongs. Um, so that's carbon. You know, car and our atmosphere was mostly carbon at the beginning, and photosynthesis has brought that carbon back into the earth. And then the other is regenerative agriculture. And what we're really trying to do with Hudson Carbon is show that there's a definitive link. If we're really going to call it regenerative agriculture, we add the adjective organic. So we call it regenerative organic agriculture. And that's our way of protecting the word regenerative from a lot of, of pirates out there looking to use it without really committing themselves to the practices that need to be there. The next step though is very much watching manure flows and methane and nitrous oxide flows specifically. In, we will be seeing in the years to come a, a, a long battle between organic farmers like myself and conventional ones about who's regenerative. 
And I, my, I don't need to choose an ideology over another. I want to choose which facts work. And the truth is, if we're really going to watch the impacts of, of um, you know, the climatic impacts of agriculture, we have to watch all major greenhouse gases. Oh, in conventional agriculture, anhydrous nitrogen um, and slurry manures are the, two of the primary sources of fertility. Anhydrous nitrogen creates nitrous oxide, which is up to 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. I clearly believe we shouldn't be allowed to use this in agriculture. And many people would say we can't go without it. I would say absolutely you can. So we're, we're watching our system for the nitrogen flow and showing we do monitor neighbor's land where they use anhydrous and urea. And there's a much, much more nitrogen ending up in water from their farm than, than ours. And the same goes, we feel that using raw manure or slurry versus a mature compost will have the same effect where the, the um, soluble nitrates and phosphates will not end up in water. They'll end up tied up in that compost that then will apply to the land um, or tied up in the biochar we mix with the compost and end up back in the land for the use by plants um, and not for the water. And then methane is, is a tremendously important topic. Um, we disperse our animals across the landscape. And the methane cycle is, methane is not a, as long lived a gas, but methane breaks down in aerobic soils with methanotrophic bacteria and other microbes we have yet to learn more about. So it's very important that we understand in, in how come 200 years ago there were just as many herbivores on the planet as there are today, although most of them were roving in herds surrounded by predators and moving. And their methane was broken down by aerobic soils with plants on them that they worked through. And in the last 200 years we've, we've worked, we've become experts at confining animals. So the animals no longer go on pastures or fields, they're no longer in the environment that breaks down methane. And then we make it worse. We alter that environment to grow annual crops using synthetic fertilizers to then truck to these animals. And then these animals make manure that's laden with nitrogen and phosphates and other nutrients. And then that goes into an anaerobic situation. We put that shit into water. And then not only are the animals belching methane, but that anaerobic manure in water is anaerobic, meaning in an anaerobic situation, even more methane is created. So we create a dub, double the, much more methane than you would by just having the animals out on grass. And we've made less grass to, and, and healthy soil to break down to methane. So our focus is very much putting grass-fed beef across the landscape. And then, and we have two research sites we've designed for where the Eddie Covariance Tower reads the localized methane reading every 30 minutes. And we are correlating the grazing, the grazing schedule with the readings of methane to understand how, what kind of methane increase do we see with and without animals? And what's the, the gross breakdown or emission of methane from those soils? to really start to understand what's the impact of a grass-based grass outdoor animal system and anaerobic, and anaerobic manure management from the time they are in a barn versus a confinement animal system with anaerobic manure management. Um, candidly, I, I don't want to overspeak, but I think that the, if you were to combine the factors of ecosystems that we destroy to grow commodity crops such as Amazon rainforest or native prairie that are destroyed to grow corn or soybeans, the synthetic fertilizers used and, and diesel used to grow those, the carbon lost from the wrong type of farming practices directly from the soil, the methane caused by these systems, and then the trucking involved of those commodities to feedlots, and then the nitrous oxide, methane, and carbon dioxide emissions from the feedlots, and then the further trucking of the food or animals from the feedlots to slaughter to the market, we could be looking at up to 40% of our global emissions in that system. And I feel that the, the single most important thing we can do is to, is to come up with viable alternatives in our farming systems and then research them and use that research to show two things. Um, on the economic side, here are the economics of it. Here's the quality of the food. Here's the quantity of the food. And also, here's the climatic impact of this. And my hypothesis that I can't prove completely yet, but my hypothesis that this system is built properly, we could have a net zero or a potentially a system that sequesters more carbon and breaks down more greenhouse gas than it emits 
while still providing a viable amount of food. Um, but it would require a major rebuild of our supply chains and the practices we use. Um, so along these lines, Hudson Carbon is very sensitive to w the farming data. It's very important to watch how the farm did. So how, what was the yield? What did it cost to grow the crop? Um, and how does that compare to a conventional system? Um, and there's sort of the, that's, it's very important to show viable food production costs uh, in this model. Um, and then we run up with issues. The ultimate issue that Hudson Carbon is working on is, okay, if it costs more to transition, um, there's an ultimately an economic, potentially an economic solution to climate change, which is that we know we have to break, cut emissions. That's, everyone seems to agree on that. Even Mitch McConnell's coming on board there. Um, but where we, where that doesn't really matter because if we cut our emissions to zero, it would take the planet up to 2000 years to break down on the excess carbon that we've emitted to get back to 300 parts per million or 280. So what do we do to not only cut emissions, but draw down the extra CO2 we have? Ultimately, we need a high carbon price. And then I say, let's set a high carbon price and let's use the funds from taxing polluters to fund sequestration. Let's make it profitable, even without the food, to reforest and grow car and grow carbon into trees and the soil, to use regenerative practices and put carbon back in the soil and in plants, to rebuild wetlands, to let beavers do their work again, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done in our own small way to address this much bigger vision that I don't think I can accomplish, but I hope that many collaborators can accomplish together, is we're building something called the Hudson Carbon Marketplace. And what we're doing is taking all of our five years of data and our regression model um, and we're embedding that into a map of the farm in, where the carbon sequestration actually happened on a grid so that we'll give companies and people the opportunity to offset. But instead of some ambiguous offset where you click that you save five trees or that you offset your plane ticket, you actually get to come to the map of the place, see, a, see drone footage of the farm, and then click on a, on a map your, your carbon. So if you want to check out, a, you want to offset a ton, or your whole year, which might be 12 tons, you can click the boxes and that carbon is reserved for you. Um, and we're making an interactive way to display and show our carbon that we've sequestered and sell those credits directly to people. We are also building a partner portal where we'll use the same framework so that it can work anywhere on the map of the earth. So anywhere there is a regenerative farm, a reforestation project, a wetlands project, our goal is within two years to be able to register that, product, that project work with a third party creditor to verify those carbon credits because we can't do it all in-house and be, be viable. So right now we're working through our partner Carbon Yield, who's doing our verification. Um, the, uh, Sam Schiller and Claire Pluard with Carbon Yield are working with Nori to verify our carbon credits. Um, it's very important that we have third party verifiers so that we aren't self-serving and we need to set the precedent that outside scientists and groups are looking at this data um, and that it's viable. Um, but getting back to that, our, our goal is that the partner portal, will, we're planning an international rollout in conjunction with Regeneration International, highlighting eight to 10 international farms and food systems ranging from shade grown coffee to biodynamic bananas to regenerative grazing in Africa um, to organic sugar production all the way. And then very importantly, silva pasture in Brazil, reforestation mixed with pasturing in, in deforested Amazon land and an agave project in Mexico where agaves are tremendous carbon sink. And a group there has figured out how to ferment them into animal feed. Animals would previously not touch agave. So we're wanting to highlight important projects and important ecosystems that are all at risk that have a lot of carbon sequestration potential and present these projects in the same way we will ours in a map based right at site format. Um, our first step of the partner portal will be onboarding another couple farms in our region and a forest and wetland in our region. And then phase two, two years from now, will be rolling in uh, a group of international partners highlighting very important ecosystems and, and important food crops within them. Uh, one of them I didn't mention will be a rice system. Um, so our work we're hoping triggers uh, uh, more research under the Hudson Carbon umbrella. We plan to set up in our initial eight international sites, pretty robust research, just like we are here. So we can build really good modeling um, of those systems. 
hopefully kickstarting many more farms to, to adopt as long as we can sell the credits. So my, my whole goal on the marketing of carbon credits is ultimately that we get big emitters to, and we see this in the energy sector, we see some companies who sell oil saying they're gonna be net uh, zero or negative within 30 years. I only see one way for that to happen is they either have to switch to providing clean energy and offsetting. Um, I, that, that's what I think is gonna have to happen. So I'm hoping that this movement becomes something uh, that achieves scale and, and I'm hoping that several sectors of capitalism realize that capitalism can't exist if we don't save the planet on which we practice it. Um, I'm seeing glimmers of hope in the insurance and energy sectors um, that, uh, that if they even want to be in business, they're going to have to participate. And I'm hoping that Hudson Carbon at least offers a, a beacon or a glimmer or a, a, some help in this space. Um, a big question in all of this is one of scale. And at what scale is it appropriate to farm regeneratively organically? I would respond any. And at what scale is it appropriate to research? I would there respond that it's important that we research each element of the food system in depth. So being that grain farming is something that's on the scale of generally thousands of acres or multiple hundreds in America, that's the scale we've researched here. My background is from small vegetable farms that use lots of compost and handwork and a small amount of diesel and built their soils. And I would argue that really needs to be studied because I think a plethora of small vegetable farms is the future as opposed to a few that are living off limited water uh, and even more limited water coming up the Colorado River Basin or out of the Sierra Nevadas in California. Uh, if we're looking at rice systems, it's very important that we understand the dynamics of rice systems that don't emit much methane or CO2 versus those that do. And in many of the rice culture parts of our world, people grow a half acre of rice uh, and that's their living. So it's important to understand what can be done in one small plot. And then the impact could, if it's if you have a successful way to sequester carbon or limit gas uh, flux out of rice paddies is determined on a small area, then that could expand to many. So really, the scale of the carbon and climate research with agriculture, I feel really needs to follow the scale of the food system it's looking at. So, and depending where we are in the world. In America, our society used to be an agrarian one, and now it's less than 1% of us are farmers. So our scale of our farms has become very big, and I would say that's an unfortunate thing. If you go to a place like uh, um, Myanmar, I don't know if half the population are still farmers, but it's probably close to it. If you go to Kenya, you still have many farmers, and many of these farmers run smaller plots. Um, and these smaller plots are a very important part of the future for A, food security. We need to find ways for these farmers to stay farming and making food for a large portion of the population. And B, the way they farm is important. Getting a smallholder farmer to stop burning their land and switch to composting and, we're, and cutting that dry matter by hand. If, if a half a billion small farmers stop burning their land, all of a sudden we've solved a big part of our climate problem. So, but that research could be done on a small scale, watching a few small scale farms. But if we're looking at the use of anhydrous nitrogen in a certain set of practices in soybean production, we're likely looking at hundreds or thousands of acres. So this, the question of scale is, and this question of scale is a question that the answer could go on forever because it's also one of the history of farming as farming in America went from smaller scale to larger scale, food prices relative to GDP became low. Food got cheap, but then healthcare got expensive. And there's a pretty big direct correlation between as our foods become cheaper, we've become unhealthier and our healthcare has become more expensive Countries like Italy, where the farms are small, have more expensive food, less expensive health care, healthier people. In general, these are the trends we see. So it's very, the question of scale and agriculture is one that I, I could ramble on about forever, but I think that it's very important to look at the scale of one's research in agriculture to the, to the type of, and, and fit that research to the type of system being monitored and the potential impact of that system.